I'm joined now by Darren Wright, who is not only an insurance advocate, but is also the chair of the Minister's Canterbury Earthquake Recoveries Community Forum, and he's also on the board of the Residential Advisory Service. Welcome, Darren. Thanks very much. Thank you for coming on in. Now, as an insurance advocate for many, for many people, what kind of success have you had in actually helping people with their claims? How's it gone? Uh, well, I've settled sort of around that sort of $50 million worth of claims for people, ranging from sort of uh, small to large residential properties through to large commercial entities as well. So, so um, you advocate for businesses as well as Yes, yeah, so I've done a fair bit of um, commercial settlements as well, okay. and actually getting those commercial buildings over the line. Um, they're a lot easier because they're a lot less emotional and a lot easier to deal with. So. Right. Yep. It does become more complicated when you've got all those emotions involved. How important is it to have an advocate, do you think? Um, well, I think it's important for people who have got to a point whereby they're just stuck and maybe they can't move forward. But there's a range of services out there now. Um, when I first started, there really wasn't much for people, so there was quite a big space to step into. But that has changed significantly, and we're now seeing a lot of other services like the Residential Advisory Service, uh, the, the CS, and sort of um, CanCern stepping into that space as well. So there are a lot more services out there to help people now. Are you also involved with perhaps sending people off into these other directions if they're going to be better suited working with the yeah, Residential be, Advisory Service? Or? Yeah, for sure. To be quite honest, now um, most of my stuff is I advise people to go that way first of all, unless I think they've got something that's very specific and can be dealt with quite easily. Um, I actually advise people to go to the Residential Advisory Service. Um, for one thing, it's free, and I'm, and I'm not. Um, it's an independent service. It's got access to the legal advice they're going to need, which they don't have to pay for. Um, and now it's got the technical panel up and running as well, so it's getting some technical advice. Um, so it's really getting people along through that process. And um, every now and then I might get one pop out that needs a bit of extra work or they, they, you know, they just need to take it a bit further. How long have you been involved with the board for the Residential Advisory Service? Um, I've been on the board of uh, RAS since it started, right. Um, right back from its conception when the Minister started to bring it together. And it's, um, it is funded by um, the Insurance Council, you know, ICNZ and EQC and CERA. So some people struggle with that. And that's why those people, I might advise them to go to CS, which is that very community-based advisory service. That's but, a bit more independent. Um, well, I would. Uh, yeah, RAS is definitely very independent because that's actually part of my role to sit there and make sure that, sort of, as a community representative, that that independence is maintained. And yeah. that's something I'm quite passionate about and quite strong about, and very confident in that 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 the RAS is very independent and has maintained its independence all the way through. Um, but it some actually wouldn't work if it's not, I would No, clearly think. wouldn't. Yeah, um, okay. To have any input sort of down into the operationals by sort of the people who have funded it would cause problems. And to be honest, they don't want that either. Right. They've they got enough very much, to worry about. Yeah, yeah, and they very much understand that it's an issue for people independence and that they need to keep that independence in there so that their people can move forward. So, yeah, I very much push people through there now. Um, and really operating quite, quite more in the commercial space. So, okay, so with your work personally, how on earth are you managing to fit all this into your, to your day personally? Because this sounds actually like quite a lot of workload. How do you keep the balance going? Well, I think we're all struggling with that sort of yeah. work-life balance at the moment, aren't we? Um, well, basically, to be honest, for me, as the RAS and the CS and these other services have grown up, um, I've dropped back and not doing quite as much of the advocacy work as what I was because okay. I think that that service is there for them. So when you have a customer who knocks on your door, picks up the phone, says, mm -hmm. you know, help, what are the first things that you do? Do you sit down and talk with them? Do you have a quick chat over the, the phone? No, generally I'll um, have a quick chat over the phone and that may then result in me just giving them the RAS number and saying to them, you know, I think you can get some help through these people, they can help you out sending right. them to that. Um, if it's more complex than that or if it's, for example, a commercial one, then I would go in and sit down with them and work through it. I sort of call it my cup of coffee. Yep. Um, and to be honest, nine out of ten finish at that. I can give them enough there just for them to go off and you know do what they need to do. And maybe one out of ten results in me actually having to get involved and sort of help them work through. And generally that's around um, people who simply don't have the time Right. Or they have got some complexities going on for them, for them, that means they just can't deal with the situation and they really just need somebody to come in and, and deal with it for them. So for people who want to approach you, what would be, you know, say some top tips that you could give to them to say, right, think about this before you 
Yeah. Those next step? So what the three things to? for me, um, and, and it's been it's, it's an evolving thing as time's gone on. But right now, it's for me, it's about actually get some advice. Um, if you're not settled yet, then a you've waited a long time, so there's a whole lot of um, stress issues involved in that, or you've got a very complex case. So it's about get some advice. Um, what sort of advice are you talking? Well, are you again, talking I legal would, advice. No, or? I would advise people to go to the residential advisory service right, or, to, okay. or, or to CS. Um, you can go into either of those, even if you're just confused about the process, yeah. even if you're just not sure where to go to next. You don't have to have a legal problem. Um, so they're very good at helping people step through those processes, bringing in the entities that are needed to come in. So okay. the first thing to me is get some advice. And I guess if you're not satisfied, once you've gone through those free services, then it's about trying to engage someone who you, know, you might have to pay for, but is a bit more focused on yourself. And I guess just remind people now that there is um, funding available for that. <coughs> the um, Red Cross grant is available, so people should really make use of that. That's still sitting out there. Well, that's a good tip. Yep, yes. so people can go and they can apply for the Red Cross grant, and that should be enough for them to get that first bit of legal advice from their own lawyer or from their own engineer or from some other specialist they think they might need. <coughs> so it's about getting that advice. I think the next step for me is really getting people to understand it's it's actually about being pragmatic. It's about just trying to move your claim forward. Okay. And so I give people a lot of advice around, look, you need to look at what's good for you, where you are at the moment, and then what's available to you in trying to settle your claim. Okay. And it's not one size fits all. Um, <clears throat> I know certainly some advocates will go out there and say, no, you know, you've got a million dollar foundation here, we need to go to court, and we're gonna go through the courts, and we're gonna get you all this money. Um, that's one approach. My approach is far more, um, look, you know, we need to move towards a settlement that's fair for you and fair for the insurer and allows you to move on with your life. I right. put quite a bit of effort into really focusing on the, the individual moving on with their life and actually coming to a solution that allows them to do that. Yeah, we're starting to talk quite long times now. So yes, it, there's some it, very stressed people out there and there's some people who believe they have very complex problems, yeah. but when you actually boil them down, they're not really that complex. And, okay. and in a lot of cases, it's just a matter of the insurer understanding their position or them just understanding what their policy actually means. Right. And I guess not listening to what they think their neighbour got or what they think their sister's friend got and actually just focusing on their policy. I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Darren, thank you very much for joining me. Okay, thank you. So now, if you want free and independent advice about your insurance claim, contact the Residential Advisory Service, we often call it RAS as well, really good place to start. There's also Community Law or the Canterbury Insurance Assistance Service. So if you or someone that you know needs support, social services or help with temporary accommodation, contact the Canterbury Support Line or the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service. Join us next week when we'll talk to IAG and Community Law about cash settlements. Insurer FMG gives us some insight into their repair and rebuild program and Dion Swiggs talks to us about the online resource that is Rebuild Christchurch.